when I was in push to do this talk, I wondered exactly why. You know, I'm still a kid trying to navigate my way through this thing we call life. But I figured, hey, what new ideas or perspective do I have to offer besides my story, which is what I know best? My name is Taufik Bolan Abijako, and my story started on May 27, 1998. Another story that started in 1998 was Nigeria's shift towards democracy after the death of Sami Abacha, the most brutal dictator the country has ever seen. And then decades of repressive military ruling in Nigeria since its independence in 1960. Since then, several corrupt and illegitimate leaders have come and go, with little to no changes made on the social and economical condition of the country, as well as the religious and ethnical divide. I was born into a working class family of seven in the slums of Ajegunle, located in the heart of Lagos, Nigeria. Ajegunle, which loosely translates to a place where riches dwells, is the most ethnically diverse community in all of Nigeria. There are many stories of Ajegunle, and people have different views of Ajegunle. Some see it as the, as the birthplace for crime, and all the negative stereotypes attached to a slum. Life in Ajegunle and Ajangbadi, another part of Lagos my family and I lived in, was all about struggle and the constant strive to make ends meet. My older brother died at a very young age due to the lack of health care and the harsh living condition. I still remember living in one room with eight to 10 of us sleeping on the floor. And that one room wasn't just our bedroom, it was also our living room, kitchen, and sometimes bathroom. This might sound similar to a lot of stories out of Africa and even here in the US of marginalized community. But I'm here to talk about a different story. A story centered around the importance of writing your own story not only restores your identity, but it also reclaims power. Despite all the negative coverage attached to Ajegunle, there's one story not widely mentioned about Ajegunle and other places like it, and that's the story of its people. <clears throat> the untold story of Ajegunle is that of its youthful entertainment culture. Ajegunle has produced notable figures who have gone on to shape society for the better. Among these figures are writers, painters, filmmakers, actors, musicians, who have all contrib contributed to the creation of an entertainment industry that's the second largest employer of labor in all of Nigeria, with over a million people currently employed. The Nigerian film industry is a perfect proof of the importance of having a community that values writing, supporting, consuming, and continuing its own story. Despite the lack of infrastructure and resources, Nollywood films, which is the Nigerian version of Hollywood, has become staples in Nigerian cinema, also, and those in the diaspora. Even though, like early on, when cinema was introduced in Nigeria, Chinese, Hollywood, Bollywood, and other Western films were very dominant. My American friends can attest to my passionate defense of the apparent lack of quality in Nollywood films. This defensive nature wasn't due to ignorance, but instead an understanding of the importance of championing narrative. Knowing Nollywood has, in fact, actually contributed to the creation of jobs in a country where there's an insufficient amount of jobs for an ever-growing youth population due to corruption, which stems from the destabilization of West African state by Western colonialists. That itself is a different story for another day. Growing up, there's a Yoruba saying my parents have always told me, which is, In English, it means don't forget who you are, where you're going, where you came from, and why you're going where you're going. When I moved to the US in 2010, I came with nothing but my story. I also came with a preconceived notion of America being a place where money falls from trees. <laughs> that quickly died. Like, literally, the moment I got off the plane in JFK, I'm like, where, where is the money? <laughs> That's literally, oh, God. That's something a lot of immigrants can somewhat relate to. In America, a different identity was added to my story. I'm not only an African, I also became an American African. Going through the education system in the US, I became familiar with a different story, 
A story is centered around preserving and maintaining the norm. The books read in class weren't by people like me, nor came from perspective of people who look like me. My friends of color also expressed this exact same concern, and it didn't fully hit until my then six-year-old little brother came back home from school one day, crying, wanting to change his skin color. It was made fun of for not looking like the superhero he looked up to. You should have seen his excitement when Black Panther came out and all their super and all the superhero films I actually showed them of people who look like him and shared a relatable story to him. Showing the importance of rep representation, especially at a very young age within community of color. I shared that same exact excitement during my senior year in high school when my IB English teacher announced to the class the next book we were studying and analyzing was that of Chino Achibe called Things Fall Apart. This excitement stood out to me for multiple reasons. Not only was this the first time studying a relatable story in a school setting since moving to the US, I was like, oh my god, finally a book I can actually, you know, pay attention to. <laughs> Not only was that the first time, it was also the first time I've seen a full dedicated curriculum centered around the story and perspective of a black person. To my surprise, it wasn't during Black History Month, because that's the only time we actually learned <laughs> about Martin Luther King and all of that. <laughs> Around the same time in high school was when I launched my clothing line, Head of State, which got its name from a song by Fela Nikolak Mokuti called Coffin for Head of State. I had little to no fashion training besides the weekend tag along with my dad to a small studio back in Ajegunle nor did I have enough financial resources to properly launch a clothing line. I was able to put together my first collection and doing some research online, piled up up to 200 email addresses of top editors who worked for major fashion publications I wanted to see my work on. I sent them a lookbook, you know, after sending all the email, I refreshed my email every second waiting for a response and none of them got back to me. This first stage of rejection was also the beginning of a moment of self-reflection. I realized the work I made was what I thought people wanted to see. My references were too Western and shared no resemblance to my actual story. At that moment, I had like, you know, just going through books of self-reflection and I realized I lost sight of my identity due to constantly being fed a one-sided story and coming to accept that as the norm. In Achibe's Things Fall Apart, I learned from the Igbo elders that there are two answers to any question. While in Achibe's philosophy, I realized if you don't like someone else's story, write your own. So I decided to write my own story. The idea of two answers to any question isn't about truth, but acceptance. It's about what happens with more perspective. What happens when we allow our mind to be open to point of views, not alien, but parallel to us, we learn something new. At that moment, things somehow clicked for me. Writing my own story wasn't a rejection of Western ideal, but instead an attempt to fully understand my cultural upbringing. Going back to the Yoruba saying of, don't forget who you are, where you're from, where you're going, and why you're going where you're going. I realized where I came from inspired the Picassos. Where I came from revolutionized modern art, not Picasso. I also learned from other contemporaries in different fields outside of fashion whose story I could relate to. From Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's powerful writing to the bliss and magic of African culture captured by photographers like Malik Sidibe and Silo Keita, as well as the political activism and powerful music of the great fella Nikola Kokuti. These are the people who inspire me and the stories that inspire me. Around the, same, around the same time, my narrative started developing and my story and work was more relatable to kids from Ajegunle and other marginalized communities. Even though their story might not be welcome in an industry that constantly ignores their perspective, what it does is it challenges the only widely accepted perspective and that is of the privileged. So for those in a position of power, open yourself up to more answers, more narratives, more story, more perspective, and you'll learn more about the world.
Well, for those whose story isn't being told, your truth is your weapon. When, when you reclaim your narrative, the power exists just from doing that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> By the way, I have this. There's no slideshow to present. I just thought it was cool and it makes me look official <laughs> giving a TED Talk, and I requested for it backstage. <laughs> <laughs> in case you guys are wondering. But yeah, the act of writing your own story not only inspires people around you, but also can make a big impact on, on the world. Just like the people from the village of Makonzi in South Africa who developed their own internet network called Zenzileni. Zenzileni means do it yourself. Community is at the heart of Zenzileni's model. All generated income stays within the community fostering the local economy mm -hmm. growth with little to no assistance from the South African government, challenging the typical narrative, the typical stereoty stereotypical narrative of innovation in Africa. Another good example is that of my Nigerian youth back home who actually responded to a statement made by the Nigerian president during the Commonwealth Business Forum, referring to them as lazy and un uneducated. First of all, a lot of Nigerian kids are like graduates and there's little to no jobs available. So the president had no right in the first place to call them lazy and uneducated. But in response, a hashtag lazy Nigerian youth campaign started with young Nigerians voicing their displeasure while using this avenue to sh not only protest but also showcase what Nigerians do best, which is our entrepreneurial spirit. Young Nigerians started making t-shirts, hats, and other little items with lazy Nigerian youth re re printed on them, reclaiming their narrative, reclaiming their, their identity. Our identity is constantly stolen, commodified, and sold back to us. What happens when we take that back? What does that power do to us? The act of writing our own story defines our narrative, defines our identity by naming and defining ourselves and also speaking and creating for ourselves. For those who write their own story, I admire you. For those who don't know what to write, please, I'm begging you, write your own story. While for those in a privileged position whose story has been the norm throughout history and to this society, listen to this community of storytellers. You learn something new. They have always, there's always new ideas out there. Regardless of what industry you're in, appropriation is not the answer. Whether it's fashion, film, art, education, corporate institutions, or politics, the table is big enough for everyone and for all stories. Thank you.